Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having a great weekend. And let's say hi to Jay Cobley. How are you, Jay? Hello, Mark. It's good to see uh, see you and always everybody else. Thanks a lot. Welcome. So today we're going to be talking about spiritual authority, particularly the relationship between masters and students, and how it is that we can learn to locate the teacher within us. First of all, let's let me say there are many worthy, authentic teachers working in the spiritual space. Lots of people who walk the talk and know their stuff and have enough humility to know that theirs isn't the only answer. Teachers like this are aware that they're imperfect vessels of whom their students should continue to challenge, to question, and finally, if they learn their lessons well, leave. Like therapists and wise parents, bona fide spiritual teachers hold the firm intention that their children, clients, students outgrow them and move on. They never encourage dependency that disempowers the disciple. Authentic teachers and healers want us to build enough self-trust, belief, awareness to go our own way. I've seen this in my own relationship with an Indian adept named Mother Mira, whom I've known for 35 years. Mother Mira is an extraordinary being, but she never wants you to hold people to her. You know, I've seen time and again when followers want to give their lives to her. They want to leave their homes and their families and become her, her servant devotees to commit themselves completely to her. How Mother Mira always tells them to go home, to live their lives in the world, to take care of their families, and to come and visit her when they need her. She never, ever urges them to relinquish responsibility for their lives in the guise of spiritual devotion. Instead, she encourages them to integrate the divine path with the human path and focus on dissolving the separation between so-called holy and so-called worldly so that they can stand on their own two feet as spiritual beings. When teachers demand loyalty, exclusivity, money, renunciation of worldly lives, you know, when they tell you that you need to follow them because they have the answer that's going to save your life. The best thing a seeker can possibly do is find the closest door and not look back. If a teacher blames your unwillingness to give them your life on resistance that you need to overcome, this is spiritual entrapment, not liberation. I like what the great 20th century Saint Ananda Moy Ma said about this. This is what she said. A saint is like a tree. She does not call anyone, neither does she send anyone away. She gives shelter to whoever cares to come, be it a man, woman, child, or animal. If you sit under a tree, it will protect you from the inclemencies of the weather, from the scorching sun, as well as from the pouring rain, and it will give you flowers and fruit. Whether a human being enjoys them or a bird tastes them matters little to the tree. Its produce is there for anyone who comes and takes it. And last but not least, it gives itself. How does it give itself? The fruit contains the seeds for new trees of a similar kind. So by sitting under a tree, you will get shelter, shade, flowers, fruit, and in due course, you will come to know yourself. Isn't that a beautiful image of the saint being like a tree? A tree doesn't call anyone or send anyone away. It offers shelter to whoever cares to come. And that's my experience with genuine spiritual teachers. There's not the least bit of clinging or codependence. Do you hear the openness in the way Ananda Ma talks about the teacher? There's the complete absence of any attempt to control or possess. And this is so antithetical to other gurus who let their personalities get in the way of their teaching. I know a guru who responds to students who want to work with other teachers as if they were lovers betraying a spouse. He shames them for being spiritually promiscuous. But we have to remember that novices in Tibet are instructed to test their teachers for 12 years before they become their pupils. When you compare discernment like that to the gullible way in which many Western seekers throw themselves blindly into practices and cults, the difference is really striking. In the same way that no sane person would get on an airplane flown by a pilot who hadn't demonstrated her ability to fly, 
nor submit to brain surgery by a doctor who promised you they know how to use a scalpel, although they didn't show any actual proof of that. It's deadly and often disastrous to be gullible in matters of the spirit, where it's all too easy to be a fake. Another great 20th century master, the Parsi adept Meher Baba, refers to this kind of fakery as spiritual jingoism. Remember, a jingo is generally someone who has an extreme bias of self-superiority or nationalism. In this case, the jingo is the fanatical teacher who's intent on gaining influence and profit. And this is what Mayor Baba told his students. In no sphere of life is jingoism more rampant than in the fields of spirituality. The whole world is pining for light and freedom. To meet this recurrent and poignant demand, there always arise a plentiful supply of those who claim to meet it adequately. Most of these claimants are impostors. Those who can meet the demand adequately are extremely rare. Extremely rare also are those persons who can either recognize or profit by the true claimant, in other words, the seeker. Among seekers, there are two categories those who sincerely struggle with their backs against the wall, and those who pretend to seek. And he continues, the temptation to seize the ideal of enlightenment imaginatively and pose as having realized it is so irresistible that there are very few who do not succumb to it. This is the origin of the fraudulent saint or the spiritual jingo who walks and talks with his nose in the air and arms akimbo as if he were somebody very special. Isn't that great? This is the origin of the fraudulent saint or the spiritual jingo who walks and talks with his nose in the air and arms akimbo as if he were somebody very special. Now, Mayor Baba is making two important points about the pitfalls of the student-teacher relationship. First, how easy it is to prey on people who yearn for spiritual comfort, you know, using their sincere desire against them in order to exploit or control. And the second point is how hard it is to prove or disprove the authenticity of a self-described master on the basis of their appearance. This is very, very important. To avoid appearances of holiness is half the work of discernment when it comes to spiritual teachers and spiritual masters. Unfortunately, in a material culture like ours, we're not given any education in spiritual development or how to recognize indicators of genuine wisdom. For the vast majority of Westerners, spirituality is a sideline, a hobby, a special interest, something that we kind of do on the side but don't take completely seriously. Spiritual discernment is viewed as being outside the educational wheelhouse, you could say, of the West, of our culture. In the same way that emotional intelligence plays very little part in the education that we give our children for life beyond the classroom. We have no education in spiritual discernment whatsoever. And that means that we're left to figure it out for ourselves, which means that people tend to either follow blindly, they assume the tradition they are born into, or they ignore spirituality altogether. A lot of people select their path the same way you might pick out a spa treatment. You're using those same criteria. How good will it make you feel? How much immediate gratification will it offer? And how little does it ask of you to change? The truth is that we seek consolation for the most part, not self-confrontation. We want comfort and the illusion of security more than the challenge of knowing the truth of ourselves and moving beyond the little me. We imagine somehow that transformation can be bought at a price. We're also fooled by charisma. Charisma is a very dangerous thing. Psychologists will tell you that people in the dark triad, meaning sociopaths, psychopaths, and toxic narcissists, are often scintillating characters. You know, they bowl you over with their brilliance, the strength of their convictions, their unusual gifts. But charisma has no guarantee of morality, nor is it any guarantee of enlightenment. As many people I know over the years have found out the hard way. I knew one woman, for example, who had to escape from the Rajneesh ashram in Oregon in the middle of the night after there was a poisoning attempt by the guru's lieutenant. She had to run for her life. I know another whose teacher cornered her, demanded sex, and was completely cruel and disrespectful to her in his treatment afterward. I know another 
person who was raped by his priest and shamed from telling others. In fact, the priest threatened him with a public humiliation if he told anybody. So the list goes on and on. In each of these cases, the student was sincere, devoted, and vulnerable, and the teacher had not done their own psychological and spiritual homework. They hadn't cleaned up their own psychological basement or prepared themselves to help others without the temptation to dominate them or use them for their own purposes. There are teachers who are superb meditators who gossip and drink too much. There are masters with deep realization on the transcendental plane who are imbeciles on the physical plane. There are teachers with sexual issues, bad marriages, alcohol and drug problems, extreme neurosis, self-deceptions of all kinds. Just because you've woken up in one area doesn't mean you're not dreaming or comatose in another. What separates the true teacher from the spiritual jingo with his arms akimbo acting like he was very special is the degree to which the teacher has devoted themselves to untangling their own knots, to looking deeply at themselves without protection and separate their neurotic personality from the deeper awareness of the true self, the teacher within them. When authentic teachers are confronted with their flaws, they tend to respond with compassion and openness. When the students of the Zen master, Maizumi Roshi, told this Japanese man that he was an alcoholic, he went to AA. When a teacher of non-duality named Eli Jackson Bear had an affair with one of his students, he sat in front of the Sangha with his wife, the spiritual teacher, Gangaji. He admitted what he'd done. He told them he had work to do. And he opened the group up to a conversation about how this had affected them. And this was extremely painful for many people involved. But the point is that their community remained intact because he was open, he was honest, he copped to his own behavior. And there was no effort to cover it up or to blame the students for not understanding their crazy wisdom. When we expect our teachers to be superhuman, we set ourselves up for disappointment and we set them up for grandiosity. And that's what turns into spiritual codependency. But when we take a two pronged approach to seeking, meaning that we have enough openness to learn and benefit from a teacher's guidance and check our egos at the door, but enough empiricism to test our experiences and make them our own, that's when we stand the best chance of awakening through their example and their instruction. Now, here are just a few rules for the road when it comes to teachers, things I've learned over the past 40 years on this path. The first is we have to beware of projections. Projections go both ways. There are projections that the student has on the teacher, parental projections, divine projections, authority projections, better than me projections. And there are projections that teachers have on students as being the ones who are going to shore up their egos, who are going to make their work visible and valuable in the world. So projections go both ways. And it's extremely important when we're in a spiritual relationship with a teacher to be aware of our own projections, particularly the parental ones. It's very, very easy to project all of our unmet needs onto a teacher and then wonder why they fail us and why we're disappointed and or in inappropriate relationship, wrong relationship with the teacher. The second rule of the road is to read the labels, (laughs) read the labels. In other words, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If you come into the presence of a teacher, a master, somebody pretending to know something, pay attention, pay attention to the details. How do you feel inside? How much contradiction is there between what they say and what they do? Does it seem like there is uh, usury, like there's exploitation going on? Keep your eyes open. We need to keep our eyes open in this relationship and trust our own instincts and our own intuitions. This next rule is not to trust appearances, like I was saying. You know, we are very easily duped when it comes to morality, when it comes to spirituality. All a person has to do is put on a priest's collar and we imbue them with all of these magical traits and virtues. We cannot trust appearances. The same thing goes with putting on Indian dress and a bindi in the middle of your forehead and telling people that you reach the higher planes of consciousness. Okay, we cannot trust appearances. There are hypocrites 
in every field. And as Mayor Baba was saying, in the spiritual field, they are as plentiful as anywhere else because we simply don't have the criteria to judge these people for ourselves. Don't trust appearances. Listen to what they say and pay attention. The next point is to question your feelings and where they're coming from in you. And this is very important because we can have resistance to spiritual authority that it's best to overcome. If that's coming from our own insecurities, our own fears, the places where we defend ourselves. But if your resistance is coming from a sense of wrongness, a bad fit, or something that doesn't feel integrous in the teacher, then pay attention to the source of your feelings when they come up. Because a teacher-student relationship brings up every kind of feeling. It's a very intense connection. The next point is to avoid charisma. Now, sometimes you can't help it. There are wonderful teachers who have a lot of charisma. But charisma in general is questionable. It can be used to paper over so many character defects. We've seen it across the board from televangelists to Rinpoche's to Buddhist teachers who exploit their students. Avoid charisma. It's lovely to have a good personality. And obviously you want to work with somebody who appeals to you and who, with whom you feel copacetic. But charisma in the sense of that magnetic thing is a cause for vigilance. Okay? Be careful about that. The next point is to say no when you feel it and connected to that. Say no when you feel it. You have the right to say no. You don't owe your teacher your fealty or your loyalty or your devotion. It's up to you which direction you take and where you feel led. Ananda Moima used to talk about following her kayala, her kayala, the divine breeze, the whim inside of her and where it was leading her. If you feel led away, from the teacher you're working with, the community you're with, and it feels like it's coming from your heart, pay attention to that and learn to say no when you feel it. The next point, obviously, is that there's no right way. There is no right way, nor is there necessarily a single right way for each of us. And many people walk different spiritual paths in their lifetime. That does not make you a dilettante. If you are a non-dual kind of thinker, if you see the spiritual world holistically, there are many paths up the mountain and they're, they're going the same way, then you recognize that there's no danger in using different practices from different traditions. That doesn't mean smorgasbord style spiritual practice. We need to apply ourselves, certainly, but it doesn't need to be quite that strict. For example, when some devotees of Mother Mira came to her and said that Amachi, the hugging mother, was in a nearby city, Mother Mira said, go to her, go experience her. The devotees felt so guilty for wanting to have a hug from this extraordinary being. Mother Mira wasn't threatened by that. No serious teacher would be threatened. The next point is that all teachers are dispensable. This is very, very important. You know the Buddhist adage, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Now, what that means is that we don't want our teachers to become icons. We don't want them to become the channel we think we need to reach the divine or to reach our enlightened nature. All teachers are dispensable. And that's not to disrespect them at all. It's to mean you've done your job well enough. Now I can move in another direction or I can trust standing on my own two feet. The next point is be aware of your motivation and what it is that attracts you to a particular teacher or teaching. And try to err on the side of truth, not comfort. You know, most religion is there to console us. It's there to offer comfort. This can be a beautiful thing. It's served millions of people very, very well, but it's not the same as self-inquiry and discovering our own true nature. That requires discomfort along the path. So if we're looking for an upholstered, cushy kind of spiritual life that doesn't demand anything of us, that's not likely to bring transformation. What brings transformation is a sense of security combined with challenge, right? So the teacher, like the good enough parent, the good enough teacher gives you enough room to hang yourself, but you feel confident in the attachment enough to explore. And that's really the relationship we want. Uh, Truth, not comfort. The next is to avoid biased reasoning and rationalization. This is something that we all do when we fall in love. It's so easy to fall into biased reasoning, coming up with the conclusions that we want to find or rationalizing away our own feelings and what we know to be true. So when you come across a teacher 
and you're keeping your eyes open and you're open but discerning, try to avoid or be aware of biased reasoning, the way that you excuse them for things that perhaps they need to take responsibility for or things that simply don't work for you. The next point is to embrace the teacher within. And that really is the point of the spiritual path, is to realize that the guru, the master, isn't separate from us. They're reflecting back something that they have practiced perhaps more than we have. So that if we're a a fire, they're a conflagration. If we're a candle, then they're a flame. They're not something other than us. And when the teacher, as I said before, in a dualistic way says, "You, you you need me to get to God, run in the other direction. The idea that every true teacher points you back to yourself. So embrace the God within, the teacher within. That isn't grandiose. That is coming close to the truth of your own nature. The point is to become lamps unto ourselves, folks. We have this brightness within us. We have this ability to awaken. And there are many, many, many different sources that we can draw from in service to this awakening. So that's what I wanted to say to you today about masters and teachers. And let's, Jay, pull up the prompt and let's do a little bit of writing. I'd like you to write about what you have gained from spiritual teachers. And if you haven't gained much, why is that? Be as specific as you can be. We're going to take 15 minutes to write about this. And if you haven't gained much from spiritual teachers, why is that? Do you have defenses or obstacles that wisdom can't get through? Be as specific as you can be. We'll take 15 minutes to do that, please. And then we'll come back together as a group for some conversation.